This is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting from occupied Chaligi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from people, projects, and struggles around the world engaging in the long project toward liberation. You can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or at protonmail.com and send us letters at P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This week we're pleased to present something a little bit new for TFS listeners. This is a kind of informal roundtable discussion that co-host Scott and I had alongside Vicki Osterweil, who has been on the show before to speak on her book In Defense of Looting, A Riotous History of Uncivil Action. We all sat down to talk about a short and thought-provoking article which was published in January of 2022 called The Interregnum, The George Floyd Uprising, The Coronavirus Pandemic, and The Emerging Social Revolution, which was published on The Haters Cafe, and we will link to it in the show notes for anyone interested in reading it. An interregnum is defined as being a period of discontinuity in a government, organization, or social order, and it typically points to points at which there isn't a clear monarch or reigning body in a given place. The article points to the many ways the George Floyd uprising, the COVID-19 pandemic, the rise of anti-work, and what the article calls the Great Refusal, which is a pivot from the Great Resignation nomenclature of some mass media, um, have all created the conditions for a possible broad-scale social revolution. Also, stay tuned to the end of the episode if you're hearing the podcast version where we chat briefly about what books we're reading right now. We hope you enjoy this chat. A note on the audio, I messed up recording on my side, which is my bad, but Scott saved the audio by doing their own backup recording. If you're listening to the radio broadcast and would like to hear the full conversation, head over to our blog at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. But first, a couple of announcements. In the southeastern U.S. state of Georgia, there is a call-out for anti-racists and anti-fascists to show up and counter the yearly demonstration organized by the buffoonish Sons of Confederate Veterans at Stone Mountain Park on April 30th of 2022. Stone Mountain was intended by, quote, lost cause, unquote, supporters as a Confederate Mount Rushmore, including a large bas-relief carving, and was maybe the site of the second KKK being born in 1915. More info can be found on the Twitter for Atlanta Justice Alliance, and some background on this case can be found in a prior Final Straw interview with Flower. Also, a call-in campaign continues until we hear otherwise for Eric King, anarchist prisoner who recently won a court case against jailers at the Federal Bureau of Prisons. After the case, they decided to transfer him to a higher security facility across the country. The BOP has a history of setting Eric up to get jumped by white supremacist prisoners at other facilities, and the worry is that not only is this move an obvious act of vengeance by the BOP, but that he'll be isolated and targeted at USP Lee or whatever facility that they stick him in. You can find notes about the call at supporteric.king.org in our chat with Eric from April 3rd, 2022, or in the recent It's Going Down, This Is America interview on the subject. Libre Flot, a French anarchist and former volunteer alongside the YPG in Rojava, has ended his hunger strike after a judge released him for medical reasons but he'll be electronically monitored by the state pending a future court case, as reported by Abolition Media. Likely future updates and ways to support Libre Flot can be found at solidarity to december 8wordpresscom Finally, Mountain Valley Pipeline Resistor Max is facing a bunch of legal fees for locking down to block the delivery of pipeline to the MVP construction project and is looking to get some support for covering the costs. More info on that can be found at tinyearl.com slash madmaxfinds. Three of us are sitting down, me and Scott and Vicki Osterweil, who has been on the show before and who's written a bunch of really amazing stuff in defense of looting primarily or, or like we had her on the show to talk about that book. And we are just all here to talk about this article on Haters Cafe, 
which is a, a blog run by primarily black and brown proletarian folks. Um, and this article is called The Interregnum, The George Floyd Uprising, The Coronavirus Pandemic, and the Emerging Social Revolution. And we're just all here to talk about it a little bit. It's not an interview. It's sort of a departure from the, you know, format of the final straw has gone in so far. And I'm excited to talk with y'all about this uh, really thought provoking piece. Yeah. So I thought I, this is Scott, and I thought I'd start just give a quick little like summary overview of the piece. The piece is written in, in points, but I'm going to just kind of bring them all together. I thought this piece was really helpful and interesting because it ties together a bunch of different important phenomena, especially like recent ones, not just the pandemic, the George Floyd uprisings and the Great Resignation, which this piece uh, says we should rename the Great Refusal, but also the longer arc of rebellion over the last 10 years. And basically, there's this claim in the piece that the insurrection that we saw from George Floyd uprisings has been translated into daily life and so the struggle has left the realm of the political and now is is possibly moving towards a social revolution and i think that's good to kind of set us up for a conversation yeah totally like i i um yeah first of all thank you so much it's so nice to be back here with y'all it's on on one of my favorite shows it's such a pleasure just to 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 chat um especially under these circumstances um you know when we scheduled this uh things have changed um, <laughs> globally so it's exciting it's exciting to sit and like think reground ourselves and like you know sort of thinking and through our local context and, and, and what that looks like um it's, it's really valuable so i appreciate you and i appreciate uh, the audience too um yeah so like i think when when one of the things that that sort of you know about this about this piece that i that i um found like really sort of activating i guess like is the the way in which I think we have been, um, it talks about the great resignation, which has been this like wave of quitting, mass wave of quitting in jobs that has gone on now, basically since the beginning of the pandemic, but like it accelerated really dramatically in 2021. And I haven't seen January numbers, but I know that even through December, it continued to accelerate. People are quitting their jobs more and more. Some of that is almost certainly due to like the pandemic and like the conditions of work that that produces. And, and some people have, like, when I've talked to comrades about this piece, you know, some of them have sort of said, like, oh, well, you know, I think, like, the quitting is just about, like, the conditions getting worse or people having to care for each other. And, like, that might be true, but that's also still a recognition that, like, it's not possible to, like, do work under those circumstances is still... Anyway, I, I think it's really interesting because I think we have gotten in this into this habit over the last 10 years um, that, that, that this piece talks about of sort of these movement waves, right, where, like, this big movement blows up into the streets, you know, um, you know, in 2009, there's like, you know, Oscar Grant and you have the, the student strikes, but it's really Occupy in 2011 that really like sort of starts this cycle, cycle. And those sort of would be defined by sort of tactical innovation, you know, like the, the squares or sort of the riot um, in the case of Ferguson and Baltimore, like holding a space with, with rioting. And then once that tactic was sort of outflanked or defeated by a combination of the sort of left the liberals and the police, then we would sort of go back into a moment of like waiting, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what's been really interesting about the last year and a half is that like, and that th this point piece like sort of points out and really sharpens like for me, is that like, in fact, like 2020 was so big and like so consequential, the George Floyd rebellion, that we have this like explosion of basically autonomous, but not fully disorganized job leaving, right? And we've seen like memes about it, like people sharing those like, signs of like a burger king we're all closed sorry you know like everyone quits but like also the explosion of the reddit anti-work right which like became such a thing that like they like ended up on fox news and like reddit shut them down they splintered into all these like more reformist subreddits but like it was the fastest growing subreddit in like years and there were thousands of people posting about how much they hated work and it had this like very you know i spent a lot of time watching it as well and like it had a, a very like anti-recuperative tendency that was really strong people tried to like bring it into like democratic politics or party politics and they would get kind of shot down it was really like no 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 the focus is on like how our jobs suck and our labor conditions suck and we have to like destroy work and that was really interesting that that space sort of developed spontaneously in this way that's very similar to what the movement looks like which is just people quitting their jobs in the millions and yeah this piece frames that as like an attack um as opposed to like a sort of tactical defense which all those other um sort of moments were and as, as opposed to like a political moment 
th these are all interesting questions. Um, but yeah, the sort of this, this distinction between the political and the social and the attack versus the sort of reactive or defensive um, movement, I think is the stuff that's really interesting for me some, in some ways. Those are the mm -hmm. two really important, like overarching points about uh, that I think I would love to dive into. Like, what does it mean to like enter a social revolution or like, or to like move our sights beyond the political? And then, yeah, that question that always comes up because we often we just like a lot of anarchist organizing or anarchist action comes in spontaneous waves, like in reaction to things. And then we're always left scratching our heads. Like, how do we move ahead of the things <laughs> that get thrown at us? <laughs> but yeah, Amr, I'll let, I'll, or William, I'll pass to you. Oh, Amr is fine. Okay. Um, the whole like Reddit, the Reddit anti-work phenomenon is really interesting i i heard a little bit about it because like i'm not a redditor like i don't i i know of it sort of nominally but i gather that it was started by two anarchists and i gather that those two anarchists are also trans people i don't know if either of those folks are still involved in it but it's it's like for me, and like as kind of like an older millennial, the role of the internet in all of this is just fascinating. <laughs> it's just fascinating to see like how this sort of like not truly global because it's still like not yet accessible in like all corners of the world or whatever. Um, but this like more global platform than like I've actually seen in my lifetime has like really furthered this this like the, the anti-work sentiment great refusal sentiments and it's just like super fascinating to see that yeah exactly and like i think like you know the, the other thing that happened sort of um last year you know i mean obviously like most of the news attention went to you know the sort of far right or right wing you know anti-vax protests and obviously like the more recent up in so-called canada the um caravan um that was that oh, was sort of God. they they were doing Occupy again, like ten years later. Like <laughs> we, like we couldn't do Occupy if we like want. We, we would need like ten thousand people rioting to hold a square. Like we needed that in twenty twenty to hold a square for a few days. But they needed like a hundred people in trucks, you know, and they could they got to do Occupy again. Right. Whatever. It's still scary, obviously, but like the state is, you know, giving them a lot of tactical latitude in that. Anyway, that's been like where all the attention has been. That has been the quote unquote politics of resistance like during this period after the rebellion but there were also those moments of like spontaneous looting um, yeah the student walkouts and i think one of the things that the piece sort of tries to, to pull towards is like that a lot of these things that have been happening have been like less visible i mean i write about this in my book about like how during the great depression there was this mass mass wave of looting that like literally store owners wouldn't even report it to the police for fear of it entering the news and like people getting ideas so like we have no idea historically how much it was except that it was widespread enough that we know that many people didn't want to talk about it you know like that's all we know about it and that's from contemporaneous reports so you know i think the, the collapse of like school grading i i know a bunch of teachers both sort of at the university and, and primary and, and high school level and like school discipline has completely collapsed right work discipline has largely collapsed one of the things about all these people quitting their jobs is that the bad jobs like nominal wages and again like wages are very hard to determine there's debate about this but nominal wages have gone up year over year in 2021 faster than they had any time since the 70s right like it, mm -hmm. it, it led to this immediate wage increase and i think that that stuff is really interesting in this period when there's a lot of demand from the left that we like focus on organizing the workplace you know like oh you got to organize mm -hmm. the workplace and like actually we're seeing all this worker struggle but it's not really being seen as that because it's not taking this visible political form do you do you think that like because i I've, I've seen that too i used to you know drive to work every day and there was a mcdonald's on my drive and one week it was 15 you know now hiring 15 dollars and up and then it just went up and up every single week like 16 17 18 now it's at 21 dollars an hour yeah which is just incredible and I wonder too, like, with the like public perception of, you know, the sort of refusal or anti-work generally is that you see a lot of it sort of coalescing in kind of like lower wage or fast food or like jobs that are seen as like unskilled or disposable, like 
do y'all think that like that's you know affecting like how folks are thinking about it a little bit because I've, I've definitely seen that like it's not really seen of as like a general strike it's not really seen as like a worker workers organizing each other and i wonder if there's some like endemic classism in there oh yeah well like i mean when the pandemic first hit the hierarchy of jobs i feel like became so apparent based on like who was able to work from home and mm-hmm. and then who was like an essential worker which was like unless you were a nurse or doctor a devalued worker right and typically in the service mm-hmm. industry or like in the supermarket or something like that so like i think that i don't know yeah i mean that stuff became kind of pretty clear right away and listening to what you were just saying uh, i was thinking about how the people forced to work in service industry during the pandemic were also being forced to like risk their health in in ways that other people were removed from if they had these other options and that that continues even now, like with like in the people in service industry being being put into these positions that they can't really say say no to. And I think that one of the things that's interesting about thinking about the wages going up is that they this happened without workers like making demands. And this piece really talks about how you know there's a nostalgia on the left for the traditional workers' movement for like labor organizing, which like is this kind of organized way to go in a particular workplace, typically and like not in a general way, right? And like make specific demands within that instance. And this is spreading in a very different way, like not through the typical ways of organizing. And I think that also, you know, that's like another interesting, you know, the phenomena of the of social media and the internet, like you're talking about. And I think it's interesting how this piece ties that together also with the way that the discourse around police abolition and prison abolition sort of spread all of a sudden through the George Floyd uprisings. Like, you know, it, it shows us something like, you know, we can't go and like lecture people to like believe these things. Right. And like hope that they'll just mm-hmm. take them on. There's something else that like is causing this spread. I think it's not like the Vanguard party, <laughs> like going and, and, and uh, doing political lessons for people. Yeah. Totally. And yeah, and I think like one of the things that's like really valuable for me to like sort of historicize this this moment and think about it is that like there were these other incredibly successful general strikes in American history that are never seen that way. Increasingly, as people read Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, um, they're starting to see, you know, the, the general strike of the enslaved as a real thing, as a thing that happened as he, as he describes it. But, you know, every year, even before the Civil War, 50,000 enslaved people Um, obviously most of them illiterate, in many ways facing incredibly difficult modes of communication between separate plantations, even within plantations, although um, as more and more scholars are demonstrating, they were very, very good at communicating. And, and, and there was a very, very dense communication network that uh, Mm -hmm. famously Harriet Tubman used to spy on Confederate soldiers. Anyway, in any case, like, there is also in response to Jim Crow and the and the sort of fascist regime in the South, the post-slavery fascist regime in the South, or post-reconstruction, you had the great migrations, which I think don't get talked about as labor action, right? In the same way. Um, even though like people like Ida B. Wells um, at the time understood them as such, right? The the nostalgia for the classical workers' movement isn't just a kind of Marxist, although it is often like sort of worshiping of a particular industrial proletariat, um, which again, like lots of Marxists don't do, but but a lot of them do as well. It's not just that, it's also like a refusal to recognize black and indigenous forms of resistance historically in the country. And so I think it's not surprising that in the wake of a, you know, black uprising that, you know, spread so widely to, to all of society, that then we would be seeing these tactics that have a more historical echo with practices of marinage, um, migration, mass sort of networked action that aren't necessarily organized into the sort of solidarity fist of the union um, in exactly the way, the same way. And, you know, I, I don't want to get all like, you know, start talking about Deleuze or whatever the hell. But like, I, I just, I think there's, there's a real opportunity here, I think. Um, and the reason that I wanted to have this conversation, I think we all did, is because we are actually in a moment when like things really feel like they're at stake. And like, obviously, like the war and the murder and all, all the events of the last few weeks have like have increased that feeling that like there's there's a lot there's high stakes but i also think like what the piece says is that like and, and i agree with is that like the proletariat like the class is on the attack it's on the offensive right now and like i i hate we have to formulations i really <laughs> don't like them um but like it, it is a valuable opportunity to like rethink how we think about struggle because 
I think it was so vital over the last 10 years that we have all of these political struggles. And it was so important. And the piece sort of argues that, you know, that without those struggles, there was no way that the George Floyd rebellion could have emerged. But now there's this temptation to see things in patterns or as repetitions, to, to fail to recognize when things have changed, especially under the conditions that we understand them of what politics looks like, which is like unions, demands, parties, or even anarchists, like even even like, you know, uprisings, insurrections, like, I think we really, really need to like move past that as well. We, those of us who think of ourselves as, you know, mm. insurrectionary types or whatever. And I think that all of these questions are like really up in the air right now. And if they were to merge with a kind of street movement, like would provide a really serious opportunity for like total significant transformation. And I think that's, that's the first time in my life I feel really comfortable like saying that on the radio and like feeling like that's real. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Like that, this is the first time in my life that I've seen a lot of these things happen. Like it's incredible, uh, not to like parrot myself a little bit, but like it's incredible to see the things that are happening right now. And thank you also for, you know, bringing a historical context to the point of the general strike and all of that stuff. Because I think that that's like history that people are speaking of, but is a parallel that I think is very well drawn and like needs to be drawn now. I think, yeah, and there's something in, in the piece and then and then like the history that you just brought up, Vicky, too, like there's something about what gets seen and understood and what doesn't get seen or like comprehended in, in various ways. And like there's like a particular racialized and colonial history to that that we like know when we talk about U.S. history in particular, there's like a uniform narrative that's given that tries to fit things into progress or sort of like immiseration of particular groups of people um, as part of our collective history that leaves out all of these like multifarious ways that people have resisted. And then if we don't tell those stories, we can't like learn that that happened, first of all, which is like inspiring for, for today, but also like learn that there's like flexible ways to do it. And so the most visible things like that are also like whitened, right, are like the, the labor strikes. And then I think for us as anarchists, like recently, it's it's a, a certain kind of like uprising. And those things are interesting because I think like maybe one of the reasons that they get so much play and are so compelling is because they're, they do play, like the piece says, into the spectacle, right? The image of, of politics. They also tend to have an end. And like, I think, you know, sometimes in my like anarchist thinking, I, I really get into this idea of like, you know, the eruption of like moments of liberation that we like form that are temporary and then they like dissolve. And but there's something else in this piece like that's gesturing towards like, how do we not just like wait for those like untimely moments to come and echo across the years or whatever? Right. But like, how do we sustain things in the meantime? And and there's like these threads of sustained resistance throughout history that fly under the radar. And one of the things that the piece talks about, which maybe I, I would love to hear what you, you all think, is like, to what extent do we want things to be like clandestine and not talked about so that they can keep happening in a way that allows for like spaces of freedom um, and not like either recuperation or, or, you know, violence from the state? And to what extent is that just a failure from like the analysts or whatever to see that there's like really strong resistance going on? So for that final question, like, I think one of the things I've heard, a close comrade of mine, when I was tweeting about, and a friend of mine, when I was tweeting about this piece, who has slightly different politics for me, was sort of saying, oh, well, like, I think, like, you know, this sort of movement of quitting, like, will lead to this sort of mass repression, you know, and I think that's sort of the question, you know, you're saying sort of like, when we make a struggle like this legible, like, do we then, you know, risk damaging it? Like, first of all, yes, of course. Right. Um, and I think that's really important. And like, that's true. Also, though, like particularly the Great Resignation is an anti-work is a trend that the right and the capitalists have noticed. Like they brought it to many of our attention because like this is happening at a scale that none of us can necessarily really see beyond sort of a meme of an image or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But like when millions of people are quitting, like the capitalists are scared. And that's how we know it's happening because they're talking about it in Business Insider and The Economist or whatever, you know. <laughs> um, so like on that level, the question I think is right. I think it's right to think about, do we try to wrench these things into politics? Like when we do so, we do so at great at grave danger to their to their potential. But also we do want to be able to speak to each other 
and to have a context in which we can sort of organize and start to answer some of these questions. To speak to sort of your, the first half of your point though, if that's okay, unless Amar, do, uh, do you have something you wanna sort of jump on on that? No, no, go ahead. And this is like to, to veer away from the piece of it and get a little personal, but you know, like, so I've now been, you know, organizing in various capacities and writing and, and fighting for like 12, 13 years now, I think, maybe since 2009, what time, what time is it, 2008? So yeah, for ages now, right? Like it's been a long time. And like, one of the things that has happened is that like, I have grown really dissatisfied with the waiting for her, the change to come and happen spontaneously at the same time that I recognize that like over the last decade, like none of us have really been able to predict how this stuff was going to break down. And like that, like there hasn't, it hasn't really been driven by political radicals either. And so like, I don't think that's going to suddenly like start happening either, but like we have these one lives, like these one, like precious, increasingly threatened life that like, I've always loved the anarchist tendency to like say, you know, like we have to try and like build that world in the present in our own world to the extent that we can. I think like that also, but I think we can apply that to bigger scales without it being dangerous to our goals. Do you know what I mean by that? Like there's this really hard line to thread and we haven't come up with the answers. And I certainly, and anyone who tells you they have is full of shit. And so like, <laughs> including myself, even though I don't have the answer, I'm also full of shit. But I think like <laughs> there is this tension right now with like this real desire to have enough power, for lack of a better word, to act in a really like, in, in a way that like increases those possibilities and opportunities while recognizing what's going on right now, which is that like on a sort of spontaneous, which isn't a great concept, but on a sort of, on a class-wide scale, some of these attacks are happening now. Like, they're happening. And can we intervene? Because I think there's also a desire, and the piece does talk to this. Sorry, I'm just rambling now. I, I'm still, I'm really, I guess that's the point, right? We're having a conversation? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, like, the piece speaks to the sort of the leftist desire to get out in front yeah. and, like, be the leaders, to, like, be mm -hmm. the vanguard. And we saw that in the uprising where um, revolutionary organizations... I heard about this in every city where there are big things would get to the front of a march and like lead it in a circle or lead it directly into a trap or you know like all these terrible things like all the swooping and stuff and so i think like without wanting to be a vanguard and being satisfied to be participants in events and nothing more than participants in events how can we be the most effective participants in events possible in a way that like both makes our lives better and increases the chances for other people to like reach for those things you know and that's that's such a hard question because it's about power and organization, but our terms for those are so limited. This is the Final Straw Radio Show, and I'm Amr. You are hearing a roundtable discussion that Scott and I shared with author and agitator Vicki Osterweil. You can see Vicki's writing, links to past interviews with her, and links to the Interregnum, the George Floyd uprising, the coronavirus pandemic, and the emerging social revolution, all at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org or in the show notes for this episode. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. In this story, when you hear this, turn the page. Let's begin now. Yeah, yeah, I like, I think about this too. And we saw, you know, I think anybody who had two eyes and was paying attention saw like the orgs get out in front of stuff in the George Floyd uprisings. And I think that it, you know, was like, it's just such a typical tactic on the part of the orgs as a part of like power accumulation and optics and all of these things. And like, how do we... How do we not do that? And how do we participate as anarchists in a way that is like anti-authoritarian or like anti-vanguardist or anti-optics or whatever, is, if we can say that? And I think that's such an important question. And I think that like to answer that would maybe be to 
do like something of a disservice to the scope of the question itself because it's so important, you know? And, and like, it's less of a question and more of like a provocation for me is just like challenging folks to be like, this is a moment, this is happening. You know, with all the like, I remember like back in the day, people were re like really invested in this idea of a revolution. I'm just like, y'all, it's here. Um, and what do we do with it? That's like the thing that I really loved about this piece because like I'd been, you know, reading other kind of anarchist think piece that are pessimistic or nihilistic. And like this one is saying, you know, we're in the midst of at least a proto revolution, if not like a revolution. And thinking about like this question about like how we can be participants and within it without trying to like get out in front, uh, which is so important. And I wonder if we, you know, thinking about the last decade, right? That the anarchist involvement in all of these uprisings, um, not to like credit it to anarchists, and I don't even mean like a particular like person even who says they're an anarchist, but like tactics mm -hmm. learned from anarchist uprisings or uprisings that have elements of anarchism within it, like they've been accumulating over over this time, and and I think that anarchism more than in my lifetime is is like you can talk about it and people are like oh yeah. Um, like, I have some ideas about this, you know, it's less like unheard of. It gets mentioned even in mainstream aspects. And I feel like, again, like some of this kind of like spreading of knowledge or information, some of the ways that anarchists have like shown up in the streets or organized mutual aid, like is becoming like more like just like baseline knowledge for people about like how to, you know, defend yourself in this situation. That's something I, I think that that might be a way to think about it rather than like, again, this is to say that anarchists aren't leading things. It's that like anarchists are showing up <laughs> and doing things. And those things are getting like innovated over and over again throughout all of these uh, events. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. I mean, as someone who like has been doing police and prison abolition stuff for, for almost a decade now, I remember, you know, having a conversation with a friend and we were talking about, you know, like for years, it just felt like bashing your head against a brick wall. And then suddenly in 2020 you were just nodding and everyone was nodding along with you like yeah abolish the police abolish prisons and like i think there's probably like a tendency among people who identify as anarchists especially who sort of form online to like want sectarian identification as anarchists to like be really um present and stuff and there's this counter tendency that i think scott you just really really well summed up which is like that in fact like the tactics and the ideas like are spreading. And I think that that's also valuable in terms of like, obviously like attempting to the best of our ability to like decolonize and like abolish the whiteness of the ways and the Europeanness of the ways that we like think about this stuff is like, maybe the movement has gotten anarchist enough that the time has the time, like we no longer need like anarchists. I don't know, this is a weird, I'm in a weird place now, but I guess like what the piece like sort of has me asking myself and questioning and what the last 10 years have as well is like okay like this great refusal moment like in some ways the george floyd rebellion was like kind of like a summation and like a sort of intensifying and generalizing of all of the struggles that had come before you know we saw all those tactics repeated it was incredible and beautiful and really really important and like now something has shifted and we have to like move away from our dogmas in a real way that is scary. I did it again, we have to, but but it's it's scary. And part of the reason I feel partially like sort of scared, I mean, not just the state of the world, but like, because like, I don't see my comrades, all of whom I love dearly, like in my local area, like I don't see any of us moving in a way that like makes me feel like it's the answer. And even during the uprising, mm -hmm. like my comrades who I really, really love again, and who I was in the street with and who I would like, you know, like I would do a lot in the street for. I didn't see us moving in a way that I was like, okay, wow, like this is like, and myself included, I was among this we, right? Like, wow, okay, like we, we were participating and that's cool, but I want to like think about, because it matters so much, like I want to think about what we can do and how we can sort of like, how can we distinguish sectarian, tactical, ideological things that we rely on from like things that are really, really, really important actually. And it's really good they've become core, you know? And like, I think there there can be a tendency that I think is actually kind of uh, creepy and, and, and proto right wing to be like, we must reject all of our previous knowledge. Like, absolutely not. 
we have learned so much. Like we have to stay queer liberationist, trans liberationist, like anti-racist. These are all so crucial. But like, yeah, I don't know. That's just a, I don't know. It's a question. We're in a moment where we can really start like, I think cutting back some of the stuff that isn't serving us. And I think, you know, as the piece says, like in the spirit of the great refusal, like yeah. we should think about how to leave those formations, whether they're tactical or ideological or just groups or whatever that aren't serving us right now in this moment. I loved that part of the article so much, you know, the whole like, let's think about how to translate a sort of not anti-work as, as sort of a hardline definition, but like a, a refusal onto like our anarchist po- politics and praxis. I thought that that was such a cool provocation. And Scott, like, I wonder if you like, you have anything to say about that. I was just like super sparked by it. And I don't really have a lot to say about it. Like, I mean, seeing folk and like seeing how folk were moving in the streets or like moving like in the midst of the sort of uprising, like I didn't see a whole hell of a lot of it, but I definitely was just, was just like, huh, we, we did that. Or like that happened, you know, like I, like there's a question there too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking like, you know, in current sort of anarchist discourse that I'm finding most interesting right now is the kind of stuff that like William C. Anderson's Nation on No Map, where he's been elaborating a black anarchism that isn't about sort of self-identification as an anarchist. And, you know, he looks at like the sort of history of black people in the U.S. and and sees like anarchist or anarchistic or whatever, like aspects of like community self-defense and and mutual aid and and say says like there's conditions that like create this and there's like histories and knowledge of these ways of of being and doing that sort of exceed the limited definition of anarchism that like can be tied back to kind of particular european historical context and i that kind of stuff alongside a lot of the care work and accountability transformative justice and like disability justice work that I, I read that's in an abolitionist vein tends to to me to like do this kind of loosening up of anarchism into something that's like yeah it's not like who you are but it's the things that you do and the way that you do them and then it can be kind of like in all these moments so then I think when we take this into like struggle I mean the thing that like we get so caught up in like being a, a, a thing and like showing up to do a thing as a kind of person all the time you know and like I think protest is often like because it's captured by the political and this is where I want to go right back to the the idea of like moving out of the political into the social right like when it remains in the realm of the politics then we're just like announcing we're anarchists and we're here or whatever right and like to to fuck shit up or whatever and one of the things reading this it made me think I've been translating um Guy Ockingham and his writings after May 68 and and the May 68 people were saying a similar thing about the social they were calling it cultural revolution because they were like still a little bit enthralled by Mao, but like, they're like, you know, the revolution has to touch every part of life. It's not just in the realm of politics. It's not the labor movement. And this is where you get like the beginnings of gay liberation in France too. And I think that's really an interesting thing, you know, in that moment in the sixties, late sixties and early seventies that like dovetailed with like the hippies and a counterculture that wasn't really politicized and I think the material conditions for a lot of the people who were involved in that were such that they could like do a kind of subversive thing and still kind of like be part of the system so it didn't translate into the social revolution that they were calling for but I think we're in a totally different scenario we don't don't have the opportunities or like the you know like all of the kind of props that were holding up the state and the market at that time have been thrown away at this point and the pandemic has just made it even starker so like to me that explains a little bit why like a political thing can translate more you know generally and pervasively through all the strands of life the way that this this piece is like kind of arguing that it is or is starting to or can continue to do and that you know just a one more thought like um so when the pandemic hit this was my thinking and and this is like almost accelerationist or something i guess but i was like 
oh my god everyone is gonna just like suddenly become a revolutionary because we're just, we're just like faced with the contradictions of like you can't work but you need to pay for rent and you need to pay for food but you can't like get any of these things and like i was trying to do organizing just being like look like look at what like we have to do something like we can't like this is ridiculous yeah. And, you know, I got caught up in my organizing with people who were really stuck on old models for me. And like a lot of like, again, like going back to like, we need to be clandestine. We can't say anything to anyone because then it'll, and then it'll mm-hmm. be known and then no one will like them. But I was like, at some point, we just need to act right and like do something. Um, but, it, you know, in the immediate like, you know, lockdown, those conditions did not create the kind of uprising that I, I ex- hoped for, at least, and that myth I didn't really expect. This piece says something really interesting that I kind of would like to parse out about this, right? It says the novel coronavirus pandemic was a necessary but insufficient condition for the George Floyd rebellion and the great refusal. So like, where I was like, this is gonna do it. Like this piece is saying, you know, this set some things up, but then something else happened. And then the next line is anti-blackness, ableism and xenophobia were also necessary, but they are not novel though the pandemic saw a deepening of these societal codes. And it's like in that kind of weird interplay that something new happened that we weren't expecting. And I think that's really interesting because again, it like it scrambles our, our like ability to, or our, even our desire to predict things, which is I think where we fall into traps often. Yeah, that's, that's, God, there's so much there. Yeah, there's so many, so many different things. I'm all over the place. It's, this is great. Sorry, I rambled. <laughs> no, no, it's my literally my favorite feeling. Like, I'm so sick, like too much to respond to. The best. But yeah, like I think there's this question of the coronavirus, like, and the pandemic. One of the things that actually I think is so scary, not to, to shift too much about like the Ukraine situation, is that like the Democrats seem like malicious and out of touch enough to me to like want to go to war to distract from the virus right like yeah like the handling of the virus has been so bad internationally that like i do think a lot of state leaders see and and it's working as far as i can tell in like a public opinion way not that there's um there's not like a sort of 2001 you know old glory flags everywhere fascism coming back exactly but people have stopped talking about the pandemic largely you know like this is like the thing that is on people's minds but that is also I think the failure of the Biden administration's response to the pandemic, I think also should be understood in terms of the great refusal and the great resignation. Like, I think like one thing that happened was that like Trump gave us a bunch of money, right? And like clearly like the $600 for unemployment a week was like the Arrested Development meme. Like it's one banana, Michael, how much could it cost? $10? Like clearly a bunch of rich people were like, how much do poor people make a week? $600? And like everyone got this crazy raise, you know, like didn't have to work up this huge raise. There's a eviction moratorium. So like, there's all this like cash on hand and like, you know, what people did with that, with that extra space, as well as the extra anger, alienation, the mass debt, it's not a silver lining. There is no silver lining to the pandemic. These are just the conditions and we can't describe it this is a this is an absolute utter catastrophe of global scale that will never be forgotten, at least not for generations. It's it's an utter disaster, but it produced both negative and positive conditions that like gave people space to rise up, right? And people were like, okay, I don't have to go to work, I can't go party, I don't have to pay my rent, like I've got nothing to do, like fuck it, like let's get rid of these pigs, you know? Like that was like kind of this like spontaneous feeling and tactic and desire. That like that like emerged and i think part of what the democrats have been doing is like oh god we can't reproduce those conditions right like we can't reproduce the conditions where like people aren't struggling enough that they can fight us and they also i think to some extent think that the uprising is all about trump but what they you know classically fail to do is like to recognize that like the uprising happened and so many of us participated and we all remember and we all remember what it felt like and we were all changed by it and like you can't put that back in the bag with punishment, although they are trying. I don't know if this is happening in y'all cities, but like here in Philly, rents have gone up way, way faster than housing costs. Oh, and yes. they've started instituting credit checks to even like get a rental, which like I've never seen anywhere. Like not even in New York when I lived there. It's wild. And like that seems to me like a at least slightly coordinated punishment of the working class, not just for the uprising, but also for the great resignation, right? There's all this repression happening and now the war is like a piece of that as well. But, you know, to be like a sort of a classic whatever, a a classic whatever, um, (laughs) as I am, um, like all of this repression is in response to real movement 
that's happening on the ground now and real fight that like we're giving and we're, we're on the offensive and like i don't know i keep just circling back to that you know because like because like scott as you pointed out like in the 60s even in the 30s the insurrectionary movement got kind of bought off by the new deal and then sort of like the depression got sort of funneled into war production it's not clear how anyone can do that in fact the financial collapse still hasn't quite happened we've never recovered from 2009 like the stock market or 2008 the stock market has fully like divested itself from our daily lives like yeah I, it doesn't feel like they have a carrot to give us and it doesn't feel like they can wield the stick well enough so like it feels like we have we're chomping at the bit to overextend the metaphor we like we have some capacity right now i think to move there's an, another part of this piece to build off of that that I, I find interesting is like thinking about how the democrats have failed to play their you know historical role of kind of siphoning off the energy of movements and like recuperating them in in electoral politics and like you're kind of talking about that but it seems like such a an opportunity for the democratic party to take stuff they they keep having things thrown at them that they could like totally wrap up into their their shtick and use it but they're not doing it right i mean maybe it's like you're saying that they're scared of the threat that they've seen and and therefore like grasping at straws but i i wonder if the, yeah if either of you had thoughts about like why why are they so doggedly going in this other direction than what they've typically done which is to try to water down our movements with like tokenism and and like you know naming policies that don't do anything and like recuperation yeah do you want to uh, do you want to do you want to take a swing at it i'm what? i'm uniquely like ill-equipped to talk about <laughs> uh sort of like party politics but... <laughs> that's a good trait um <laughs> that's, yeah that's that's really like uh, alas alas i have some ideas um <laughs> but yeah i mean I, bernie sanders was was a slam dunk for them medicare for all i mean if they were good historians they would know that in 1945 in the UK, when the Labour Party like made the NHS, like they ran the government for 30 years. The Dems could do it. They've got a bunch of slam dunks that are pretty easy. You know, they're like the ball's in the air. Like, I why am I feeling all these bad metaphors? <laughs> um, like, they, like, but they like they have these opportunities, and like, I think part of it is that they just are genuinely, genuinely like an imperial court, like divided, like. DC is truly divided from like reality on the ground and like the pandemic has somehow made that worse yeah. it seems to me they don't even get in cabs anymore to, like talk to cabbies or whatever <laughs> they do in their op-eds you know so it's like I think it's that and also but also you know that they are increasingly like happy to be the left wing to the extent that they are the left to the republicans not as the recuperators of social movement and so I think like, you know, that now that the, the Republicans are like, you know, probably we should be fascists because otherwise we'll never get, an, we'll never win an election again. <laughs> uh, the Democrats can just be like, yeah, yeah, we're just like utterly greedy right-wing capitalists. Like that's all we are. And like, yeah, so I don't know. I think it's some combination of those things and fear of the uprising and, and you know, and I think like if you, you know, in their heart of hearts, Democrats, liberals in general, not just Democrats, if you ask them, you know, which is scarier, like a fascist uprising or like an anarchist or communist one, like they think it's scarier from the left because like mm -hmm. the fascists, like, yeah, maybe they kill them or their friends, but probably they get to keep all their property and like their nation, you know, whereas like the anarchists, like, you know, like they lose their whole worldview. Like that's a lot scarier. Yeah, indeed. I really like this part in the article that, and it's like skipping to the end a little bit, but, and the article is like written like somewhat chronologically, but there's a lot to sort of unpack in it. And it, it talks about sort of the right and the coup. This is oh, yeah, bullet point 24. The lesson they seem to have learned from the coup is that increased calls for secession and independence notwithstanding their best chance for power is the 2024 election of Donald Trump. There is therefore something of a three-way race between the proletarian movement, the 2024 election cycle, and Donald Trump's physical death. The death or incapacitation of Donald Trump would represent a blow to the American fascist movement as currently constituted that would require at least another election cycle for them to recover from. And I, I really like, I really liked this bullet point 
And I think that it like relates somewhat to sort of like perceptions and fear and sort of like the anxieties of like the Democrat or, or de Democrat institution. So yeah, I wonder if y'all have thoughts on like this point. So, you know, I'm actively frightened by the the far right and everything they're doing. And maybe we can talk a little bit about the, like all the kind of state policies that are being proposed and passed that are, are incredibly frightening. But there, while there is a street movement and like January 6th was a thing, it was a debacle. It's kind of confusing and hard to really totally understand, I think. This point is saying that in the end, the far right still attached to an election of a particular person. So it's in a way that that gave me a little bit of like feeling of like optimism that it's so narrowly focused on this one thing that just seemed to limit it in a way or like help contain it for me. Cause like in my mind all the time, I'm surrounded constantly by like Nazis basically. Um, when I'm like walking down the street in my neighborhood, you know? And so thinking about like how, how they're still grasping at the, old orders of power well obviously that that power still like kills and hurts and degrades us all but yeah something about that was interesting to me yeah i mean there's there's been like just an immense amount of things that have at least hit the newsstands i mean i had a like text from a person that i hadn't heard from in a while and the text was just like I'm thinking of you, I hope you're okay. And I like genuinely didn't know what they were referring to <laughs> because there's been so yeah. many things that have happened and it turns out that they, you know, were referencing the anti-trans stuff that was happening in the news and like with parents of trans right. kids now being liable for like child abuse or some horrifying shit um, in Texas. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I, there, there was a point on like our notes that we were like talking about fear and talking about anxiety and being like, am I out of like, am I coming out of left field being fearful right now? Um, <laughs> and I like kind of, I don't think that anybody is, you know, I don't, th I think that there are a lot of oppression fantasies that are spinning themselves out and thinking specifically of like QAnon and COVID denialism and stuff that's on the far right that I like obviously have no sympathy for. So I do name it as like an oppression or like colonization fantasy, mm -hmm. basically that people mm -hmm. are like, oh, I'm being genocided. I'm being colonized. Mm -hmm. It's just like, nah, it's I don't know. It, it it bears no spinning out here. I think like there's no reason we need to like debunk that shit. But I do think that we're seeing sort of a creep into like various things. I mean, we saw it in like fucking September 11th, like back 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 in the day, maybe some listeners were not alive in 2001. <laughs> so but um like we saw that that precipitated the formations of two like extremely fascist institutions and those were the department of homeland security and ice and ever since then it's like for me it's like in my consciousness it's been like an ever encroaching upon this mm -hmm. like you know fascist creep or whatever and we're seeing that i think like really explicitly and i think to like react to that with fear and anxiety is really normal yeah um and to to react to it in a way that's just like oh i i need to not have fear about this is to react in a way that's like maybe a bit like rooted in survival and like that is something we should honor we should whatever we, you can't do one could honor but like it's also i think really healthy to acknowledge that kind of thing yeah i i really appreciate both that point from from both of y'all because i think like you know um two years into this pandemic when like all of the forms of comfortable social reproduction like even this, you know, which is a term for like, you know, whatever, all, all of our forms of like comfortable socializing and like making ourselves feel better and hanging out, like all of them have been disrupted for years now. And like, we have watched like as world governments have utterly refused to try and fix that. You know, the thing they claim to be good for is something like a pandemic or whatever, right? And yeah. like, they just have literally no interest in, in helping us at all some countries are more brazen in that 
than others. And that has to do with, you know, their internal political and domestic stuff. But in any case, yeah. And I think like, even without that 2015 to 2020, like the rise of street fascism was traumatic. And like, I don't know if y'all had this experience, but like, there was a lot of movement, but also everyone was hyper vigilant all the time. Everyone was in like a fight or flight, like constantly. Yeah. Um, and like that was utterly unsustainable. And we didn't get to like rest from that because it, like the pandemic, you know, dovetailed that perfectly. And like, I think we have not had an opportunity to grieve. And I think one of the things that like, I think about a lot, you know, with, with regards to like sort of what, what you were saying a while ago, Scott, about the sort of classical workers movement is that like, I actually think that there has been a real repression of grief among revolutionaries for, you know, the 20th century in general, like the experience of, of that in general. And then like, I hate, I hate, don't mourn organize you know (laughs) which like was a thing joe hill said about his own death it was not a slogan when someone asked him what they should do to honor him he said don't mourn organize that is an individual's request and the fact (laughs) that's been turned into a slogan i think is disgusting yeah anyway point like don't organize mourn because if you y'all know those like really weird like squishy stress toys they have the big (laughs) bulgy eyes if you squeeze them they like all squeeze out or whatever like the way I, and I've had to experience a lot of it, unfortunately, grief and rage, if we just try to repress it, like those toys, it just pops out from in between your fingers, you know, like it comes out in other ways. And if we just like try to organize through it or fight through it, the grief is gonna shape and the pain is gonna shape the stuff that we do or the fear is gonna shape the stuff that we do. And like, it's such a crucial, you know, gift from the queer movement and the feminist movement to be like, no, stop, take care of yourself. Like, take it seriously. Everyone rolls their eyes at the idea of self-care. Okay, fine, whatever. That term is probably useless now. But like, we need, need to take care of each other. And I do think that like the mutual aid, in it's less sort of like formal ways that it has appeared, which I think have been cool, but have largely been charity, have, have looked a lot like charity or social services to me. Yeah. The, the spreading of the concept of mutual aid among everyone as like an organizing principle for people's lives has seemed really powerful to me. And like, we're all at such low capacity. And, you know, we tend to think of like, oh, everyone's going through it. Well, that's just life, buddy. You know, like Mm -hmm. if you have a very specific tragedy, oh, that's really sad. But if everyone's going through it, buck up. Like, no, when everyone's going through it, it's so much harder because no one has capacity to help each other. And like, that stuff's all really, really important and serious. As we talk about tactics and, and, you know, oh, like what, what can we do to like move forward? Like, we also do need to be able to like hold each other in this horrible, horrible time. It's been seven years of this and there've been these glimpses of hope that have been beautiful, but for the most part, it's just been awful. I love that you brought that up in terms of like feeling the feelings. And I think in the last two years during the pandemic, it's been really hard to like know because of so much isolation, like you don't have the same kind of benchmarks to know like how off you're feeling in relation to like any kind of normalcy so it's just like oh like there's something wrong with me but I don't quite understand it just like losing your kind of orientation it has been hard but I'm also thinking like and maybe this is like my <laughs> like psychoanalytic or just the fact that I've read Hamlet so many times but like thinking about <laughs> um mourning is also a refusal right it's like if you let yourself mourn you're refusing to do the things of like a productive life right you're like I'm mm-hmm. I'm not going to play the role. I'm like, I'm like so immersed in my grief that I like refuse to, to work basically, you know, I think it would be interesting to kind of think about some of those emotions and affects and feelings that we have and like how they could relate to this like social revolution of how they, how they withdraw us or, or allow us to refuse the sort of, you know, yeah, the wages that we are bribed with, you know, which are just, just, paltry just like not even scraping the bottom edge of inadequate for maintaining any kind of life you know for me like what the in relation to the government and in relation to sort of power political power systems at large what the covid pandemic really showed me was how little those structures think of sort of the populace they like hold us in such deep abiding disdain and that to me is like one of the reasons why people are like no fuck this like 
anti-work. I'm going to like walk out of my job. And it's amazing to me too, that like a lot of folk who are entrenched, like, you know, to, to call back to the arrested development meme, the <laughs> truckers who think that a banana costs $10, they still think that people are quitting their jobs because of the pandemic money, yeah. you know, <laughs> which is incredible because I'm just like, no, that was like, not all that much money really. I mean, prices have gone up every single time I go to the grocery store. I'm like, oh, this should be $25. And it comes out to like $55 or $70, you know, and like that's maybe like a whole other conversation, but perhaps related. Mm. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I kind of lost my, my thread. But... I think you didn't lose the thread. Like, I think the thread is like, is right there. Like, and this is in the piece too. Like the pandemic demonstrated this total disregard for us even at like a basic literally like we are necessary for the economy to function and like it's better if we're healthy even at that level of like even just using us as workers they're not even willing to do you know what i mean like it's like it's like they're like well like maybe we could like force you back to work and like some of you will die whatever like it's like th there's just like the total disdain and hatred and the way that that reflects on you know, the future of uh, ecological catastrophe, obviously, and war. I, I don't know about you two, but I have found it absolutely horrifying to see the world governments and media and politicians and leadership and economy act as one so decisively against Russia. Not because I want to defend Russia, but because they had this power all along. They could have been doing this to the pandemic. Yeah. They had operated so fast and so thoroughly against Russia and like, whatever, like Russia is literally engaging in an imperialist war of aggression, like fuck them. But also like they could have done this two years ago against coronavirus and they've shown us all that. And they've shown us that what they've done for us instead is like told us to get COVID and die. And like that is horrible, mm -hmm. but it also is really, really mask off in a no pun intended you know <laughs> and i think like the, the thing like we're really like like things are really clear right now and yeah. the clarity is gained at too great an expense and it's not worth it but i think we might be able to make use of that clarity you know it's interesting because like i i teach young people mostly late teens and early 20s and and this maybe connects back also to the grief but like i have found over the last two years of teaching that students are just like in crisis after crisis after crisis of like their own health they're caring for like a family member they're like losing their housing they're losing their job they're working too much all the time i'm just like making space for them to just have the crisis and not worry about like repercussions for me but like i'm just like you know thinking about how that that generalized panic and scramble and and just like care work and and grief that is happening like how that's going to affect a mass population moving forward like to me that that is the sort of like what i was expecting to happen when the pandemic hit which is like the contradictions become clear and everyone <laughs> refuses but like i mean we're being put through it in this like horrible torturous way and and i think that that's got to change people's outlooks and like obviously when i come and talk to these students i'm saying a lot of these, these kinds of things like this is this is happening to you and like this shouldn't you know you don't deserve it you know but just thinking about that, like, I don't know what we're coming out of this or w what that would even look like at this point, but just the, the people are carrying along with them this experience of like just unprecedented struggle in their in their like, quote unquote, personal lives is going to have a strange ripple effect, I think. And, and hopefully one that like allows more people to keep unplugging from this system. Yeah. And I, I think like, you know, not not to be whatever too pessimistic, but like one of the things that gave me a little bit of strength in historical analysis under the Trump regime was like, okay, but the historical fascist regimes and, and indeed like the regime in India right now and in, Tur and in Turkey to a large extent, they drew on a huge body of traumatized war veterans for whom life had become cheap and meaningless, right? right? Like in the trenches. And like, there was no commensurate experience in the United States until the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So like, we have this now this population that like i think is going to be capable of accepting very radical answers and i don't necessarily think that those are going to be good because trauma as anyone who knows 
doesn't make you a better person, no. you know, like, like it's about how you respond to it, which is, which is, I think part of why it's so vital right now that we respond to that trauma seriously and that grief seriously. And it's so funny that we've ended up here, like from starting in this conversation about like the social revolution, <laughs> but like, it feels telling also, you know? I think that's such an important point, Vicky. That's just traumatized populaces are more readily accepting of like increasingly radical or like fringy or whatever solutions to stuff. I think that that's like something I'm going to be sitting with for a while. I'm thinking like, you know, <laughs> the news, more news recently about how much worse than expected climate catastrophe is going to be and how much quicker, you know, we get, we get like something like that every year, I guess, or more frequently, like that's the stuff that we're facing in the next decade. And like, you know, we, we get inundated with the narratives of like lone wolf survivalist competition over resources stuff to like steal us for this horrible catastrophe that we're facing. And, and you put that with like the kind of trauma, I think like, it almost stacks the deck for just a horrific response. I'm hoping that like <laughs> somewhere in there, the, the like caring for each other that people are doing will like create some other possibilities. And like, you know, the caring, not just like intimately or in, like in kinship and family and whatever. I do agree that mutual aid stuff has been not necessarily as radical or politicized or whatever, however you want to call it as it could be, but like the knowledge of that, that's something that you do, that you have resources and spread them rather than hoard them and, yeah. you know, save up for the future that's not going to happen or whatever. Um, yeah, I hope that that is something that will like, at least hopefully stave off, you know, a really violent trauma response. Yeah. And, you know, like one thing that's been weirdly giving me a lot of hope lately I've been reading um, David Graeber, Rest in Peace, uh, and David Wengrow's um, The Dawn of Everything, um, which is a book about prehistory, <laughs> right? Like, it's a mm -hmm. book about, like, an anthropological overview of prehistory and just the extent to which so few societies have ever been organized on these bases of exclusion and private property and hierarchy, like, exclusively on those things. Those things have all existed, but they've rarely been coalesced an authority like in the way that this current social system has is sort of what that that book is about so i think like while i obviously brought up the specter of mass fascist movement and you know it's it's already happening it's already here obviously it's not a specter anymore alas i also do think that the reason i bring it up is because that's a possible future but i do also think that like that's precisely why <laughs> it's so important to think about how to care for each other now and how to start moving in these other directions because we can see this other thing that is perhaps further in our history for many of us, for all of us, in fact, who have been forced to live under this white supremacist settler colonialist European regime for as long as we have. But like, there are deep, deep roots to the extent in our history, and I wanna call it our history, not our nature or whatever, in right. our history that are very different. And I think as things start to break down or continue to break down rather, as this stuff all breaks down, like we can make gestures and movements together to take care of one another that, that push against that and that can radiate out in much the same way that the sort of political tactics of struggle were imitated and radiated out over our movements over the last 10 years. One great thing about the sort of mutual aid sphere that's, you know, been being fostered through like institutions at this point like food not bombs and you know prison books and related stuff it is I, I think it has provided like a really not gentle but like easily accessible entry point for people who are just getting radicalized and there are just a lot of people who are getting radicalized in like all sorts of different directions right now and I've seen the mutual aid be like a really and in and, and anarchism like historically not the greatest or most accessible thing to like come to you know I was <laughs> I can remember like being a baby anarchist and being like can I hang out with you like you guys and the people were just like actually no like keep coming to the prison books for about a year and then maybe we'll like invite you to the potluck and it's like, well in a way that was really nice to hear because it you know i love rules i love parameters so like <laughs> there's a parameter here okay i'll come to the prison books for a year like that. um 
but yeah, I mean, it's it's been nice to see that people can like go do the mutual aid and then like have society through that and like have like anarchist community through that. And that's just wonderful. That's giving me a lot of hope right now. Yeah. You know, one thing that's been in the back of my mind during this conversation is, you know, at one point, well, okay, so a lot of people will say, you know, why did the anarchists or the left or whatever, like, allow the fascists and right wing people to kind of (laughs) come out in front in this like anti state sort of demonstration against mandates, when we could have like articulated a different version of that, that wasn't about like, business and people dying, you know, you know, I'm talking about like anti vax and anti mask stuff. And, and for a while, I was like, kind of hitting my head against that, like, this was an opportunity. And like, what is like the anarchist response to this? And, and you know, like, maybe that's like the wrong question. And, and picking apart this piece is kind of helping me think that like, a very visible left slash anarchist movement around state control and surveillance uh, through the pandemic, I don't think would have been the right, like direction anyway. And like what we see with the right wing demonstrations and the fascist demonstrations around this, like we see them sort of like making their own beds in a way and we don't need to participate. And then the anarchist stuff that's happening is more clandestine, right? It's like these relationships that are being formed through mutual aid. It's the relationships that are being formed like in the streets, et cetera, that I think do a lot more. And like the people... If you really need to be convinced, you know, that like wearing a mask is like not a big deal and, it, and that it helps people, you know, like that just doesn't seem to be the place that we should be putting our um, effort and time into. But I, this this was just helping me think about that because it, it's something I've been wondering about for a while. Like, why did that space go to the right when it's typically like an anti-state stance, you know? This is like reminding me of did y'all read that piece uh, against the liberal creep? I did. did. I, 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 I flipped through it. I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> it was like, Sorry. I thought, I, I couldn't really tell like how much of it was a shit post. <laughs> yeah. Like, I really couldn't, couldn't tell. But I feel like, Scott, it was really going in that direction of being like, the, the, the right got this sort of like anti-mandate, anti-state mandate thing. And like, we should have, we should have jumped on that and like pivoted the narrative among many other things. Like I'm not doing really doing this piece justice. I'm, I'm, I'm like, honestly not sure if I would recommend it, but it's, it's interesting as like a thought, a thought exercise, I guess. (laughs) I actually read this piece and, and the interregnum piece around the same time. And I really didn't like against the liberal creep and, and what it was trying to say. And then the other, and then I think I went to interregnum and was like, Oh, okay. Here's like a more Mm -hmm. helpful (laughs) analysis for me, at least than the against the liberal creep one. Yeah, and I think like, you know, one of the things that happens and that really infuriates me as someone who who tends to think historically is like, you know, how much people are happy to forget like our very, very immediate recent history. And like in 2016, 2017, 2018, like a lot of people, you know, said, you know, we got to try and pull out from the right. We got to try and, you know, organize. We got to get in front of their talking points or whatever. And most of those people have gone to the right. (laughs) <laughs> like most of those people are now on the right they didn't pull anyone to the left like they're on the right now you know and like i think people will know will have their own particular example of who i'm talking about because there were a lot of them and they were mostly grifters right and like i think like there's like a there's this idea that like we have to like convince people you know it's our job mm-hmm. as revolutionaries who are enlightened to convince people and like obviously i'm here on a radio show i think education and discussion and like ideas are really important i write well, not quite for a living, but I get paid to write sometimes. Um, <laughs> I do not make a living doing it. Um, but, uh, but like, so I think that stuff is important, but also it's like the wrong idea of the relationship to it. Like the thing that Marxists like have often gotten right historically is that like the conditions of people's exploitation and lives like is sufficient to educate them about what's wrong. You right. know, like, mm-hmm. and like anarchists are good at that too often, you know, like that mm-hmm. like people know and like, yes there will be edge cases where someone gets like radicalized the wrong way and maybe you like encounter them in your life and it's worth arguing with them and trying to flip them definitely but like as an organizing principle like i think what this moment is really showing us is that like you know since 2020 since the george floyd uprising is that like a lot more people spontaneously are on our side just numbers wise there's just a lot more people 
under these conditions. And like, that really matters because liberals will do everything they can, as we've seen both in the rises with both Mussolini and Hitler and Trump, frankly, like liberals will do everything they can to hand power to the fascists, to keep it out of the hands of the left, like, or whatever, or the revolutionaries or whatever you want to call it. But like, we don't have to convert those liberals because they're our enemies. And like, people get confused, I think, between people who are just sort of like spontaneously like humanitarian liberal because they haven't really thought about it versus like people who are like, you know, Atlantic subscribers or whatever. There are like the 15 <laughs> of them, however many there are left. Yeah, I think there's a difference between the like people who, people want answers often, right? And like, there's like a liberal position that seems to offer answers through electoralism and and slight reforms on the status quo it's it's the same thing though with like authoritarian communists they seem to have the answer and i think they draw in certain kinds of people who are who aren't like okay with the the unknown (laughs) with embracing the unknown and and i think also we want to know the right way to act and and i think that's commendable really so like if there's any i don't know about like whatever convincing people of uh, other things but maybe just like opening the door for like more complexities and unknowns and actually that this is something i've been thinking about a lot is that how much people are motivated by being afraid of showing that they don't know something um Mm -hmm. and how much damage that causes in like every kind of situation that you could think of just like leaving more room for that and that that is another thing about this piece that I think it's like calling on people who who want to contribute to a revolution to do is to like not know it, not get in front of it, be part of it, open up for it, be honest about what's happening, you know, not like try to frame it or theorize it or or whatever. Just be like, this is happening. You know, this is really happening right now. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's really happening and it doesn't fit any of our theories very neatly. And that doesn't mean that we therefore have to jettison every previous theory, but it means we have to think and act differently in some ways. And that means being unknowing. And I always get into trouble with that, literally like with my friends and relationships. Like I'm always getting into trouble pretending no shit. And then like people be like, you're bullshit. I guess oh, you're right. <laughs> so like, it's a real yeah. problem. It's a, such a problem for everyone. And like, it's really hard to, to embrace unknowing. It's really, really hard. But yeah, I, I, I you know, as, as your expert guest here on this podcast, uh, I would like to give my expertise to say, I don't know shit and you don't either. And that's kind of a beautiful place to start. Yeah, I love that. And the narrative, I think that whatever the popular narrative is, is, is I think very slowly like skewing toward that. Uh, so that's that's also like really nice to see. I feel like this could be a, a place to wrap it up. I like yeah. keep thinking about going into like the horrible like policy stuff that's going on but i'm like no let's let's not keep like bring that back back in (laughs) yeah no i mean i just like i'm really loving talking to you both so it's it's tempting to just keep going but yeah i think probably yeah this is so lovely it's so like yeah it's it's really lovely to get to talk to you all too i love doing this it's really helpful to me as a person who who likes to think in dialogue in real time (laughs) dialogue is really nice so that's a really nice thing in the in the um, Graeber book, actually. They talk about that as a critique of Descartes. Anyway, that book's cool. Y'all should check it out. I have it. I haven't cracked it yet, but... I, I'm literally... Sorry, I mean, I, I'm assuming that... Whatever. I'm literally reading it to my partner because they just never think spontaneously to read books by men. So whenever <laughs> there's one that I think is going to be interesting, I'm like, okay, I'm going to read this one to you. Like, because you like, yeah. otherwise it's never going to happen. I love that. <laughs> it seems appropriate. Having that stance for like books by men is really reasonable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not even conscious. Like, I don't think, yes. I don't think they're even aware of it. It just happens. <laughs> they just like don't, that, you know. That's even, that's almost it's really even better. better. It's, like, it's incredibly <laughs> charming. I'm, I'm obsessed honestly <laughs> i'm actually reading a book by a man and i'm regretting it so <laughs> yeah. often the case mm-hmm. i'm i'm now i'm reading a book by a man but it's about it's about the amazon strikes and it's mostly interviews at least i think this person's a man i'm actually not sure <laughs> uh, we'll see how it goes it's good so far That's what are you reading scott I just like started reading the, uh, mo- the most recent Jeff Vandermeer like science fiction novel just uh-huh. for uh-huh. reading at night and I don't like it. I might not finish it, but I might. I don't know. I was just reading a bunch of like really awesome queer and trans stuff and then I'm like, Jeff Vandermeer. <laughs> like, why did I do that? <laughs> 
I, I had the experience in 2021. I think it's literally the first year in my entire life since I've been able to read. I didn't finish a single book. Like, I didn't read a single... It was so intense. Like, I could not read. N.K. Jemison cured that for me this year. Like, I just read her trilogy, like, <laughs> like, like in the weekend. But, like, oh, awesome. it was just... It's It's been wild. Like, it's so... I, I found the pandemic so antithetical to that kind of sustained, quiet focused dialogue with with a voice that's not my own but that's also alone i can relate to that vicky i i also like was having trouble finishing anything like finishing movies or tv shows or just like not having the sort of sustained focus that's so interesting i don't think i've like heard folk like talk about that much you know that's so funny because i bring it up and then i hear very similar like i hear something like oh yeah actually you know what i couldn't do that either and like i haven't really thought about that like i think it was a collective condition yeah Um, other people i'm in a this like queer book club and people have said that in the book club that like last year they didn't read books at all and it's and and that was like not that was exceptional for them what a time we've been living through huh yeah it's fucked (laughs) yeah i mean geez like Whew. Personally, I think 2016 year six is the worst one yet. It's the worst 2016 yet. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that yeah that you've been bearing all that, and but thank you for also talking with us now. Oh my god, literally, like yeah. Sorry, I, I, I have to keep marking that for myself. But like, it's been such a pleasure. I wasn't sure. You know, I had this long day. Like that's how I started talking. But like, this has been so delightful and given me so much like life and like i feel so held and like among friends and comrades and it's beautiful thank you both so much for for organizing this and 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 having it happen thank you yeah thanks for being willing thanks for being willing this was definitely medicinal for me as well it just feels like just getting to talk to y'all and like sometimes i think that anarchists fall into this trap where we like don't really talk about politics as weird as that might sound like mm-hmm. like delving down into sort of a nitty-gritty and i really loved that that happened here too he just made me realize like when saying that like how how often my interlocutors on that call themselves communists like when i want to talk about politics with someone it's mostly with people who call themselves communists. i mean you know like mm-hmm. anti-state left communists or whatever but like you know like yeah. like it's interesting how few like anarchist comrades i have who i like get into that kind of like broad strategic political questions because that has so often been associated with such bad left politics obviously so yeah so it was a real delight sometimes i feel like i want so bad to like be around people that i don't have to that we're i just assume we we know and share something that like so with anarchists there's a version of that that you know just same with like queer trans people or punks or whatever i'm like yeah we know something we don't have to say it you know but like but then I'm always like, I want my anarchist friends to like, I want to hear what they have to say and think about something because like that, they, they have really good ways of thinking about stuff, you know? I need, to, I need to parse it out with them. That piece was like a kind of nugget in my head. And so just like talking it through is really helpful and, and bringing things together. And I appreciate it. You've been hearing Scott and I talking to Vicki Osterweil about an article on the Haters Cafe called The Interregnum, The George Floyd Uprising, The Coronavirus Pandemic, and The Emerging Social Revolution. To hear this full episode, visit our blog at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. Also, the music that you heard at the beginning of this episode was the track Coda by Audio K off of their 2011 uh, album, Old Song which can be downloaded off the free music archive at archive.org. Also, the music that you heard at the beginning of this episode was the track Coda by Audio K off of their 2011 uh, album, Old Song, which can be downloaded off the free music archive at archive.org. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say! In the continuation of the tradition began by Sean Swain in 2019, naming those killed by police in the so-called U.S., I'll be reading Sean's segment. The information was compiled by the website fatalencounters.org. This is for the month of May, 
2021. Angelo Duan Martin, Dalton Lee Buchholz, Jose Ascension Astrain Jr., Hanad Abdiaziz, May first name withheld by police in New Mexico. Nicholas Jones, Bruce K. Pofall, Jacob Alexander Griffin, Alexander T. Tuzinski, David Earl Hartenstein, Louise Felipe Mija Salgado, Beryl Lynn Matthews, Joshua Day, Anthony Williams, Mariano Villegas, and May 3rd, name withheld by police, Nevada. Eric Daryl Smith, Lamello Parker, Brandon Lee Shockley Sr., Roy Gordon Cole, William Thomas Holt Jr., Latoya Denise James, May 4th, name withheld by police in Alabama. Salman Mohammed, Charlie Hubbard, Ashton Pink, Matthew Robert Long, Edwin Joey Joseph Castillo Jr., Jay Howell, Mark Aitulagi Lavia, May 6th, name withheld by police in Michigan, Thomas Joseph Rober, Joseph Ventra, Richard Kelly Murphy, May 7th, name withheld by police, California, Robbie Lee Hodge, Adonis Trauber, Daniel Hobbs, Felix Jerry Marquez, Carly Elizabeth Moore, Ricky G. Cruz, Jose Angel Guerrero Ortiz, Everton Garfield Brown, Justin Anya, Zachary Richardson, Jeffrey Mark Murray, Maxwell Jerome Davis, Hunter Allen Robinson, Edward Zamora Giron, Callan J. Horton, Shaquilla Imoni Johnson, Trishon Blake Harrison, Philip Stanley Watros, Christian Castro, Lance Lowe, Hannah Pimentel, May 12, name withheld by police, Washington, Michael Alvarez, Oliver Ali Taylor, a.k.a. Molly Taylor, Kieran Sterling, Adrian Murillo, Cedric Vick, Ty Quentin Stillwell, Mark D. Gaskill, Jeffrey Bruce, Aaron Schneider, Monolito Ford, Sylvester Vargas Estrada, May 15th, name withheld by police, California, Brian Timothy Dunn, Devin Telford, Lance Stevenson Jr., Marcus Mark the Barber, Jeffries, Timothy Fleming, Bella Claire Calloway, Christopher Michael Stewart, Denzel Nathan Clark, Garrett Shepard, Matthew Lee Crisp, May 17th, name withheld by police, California, <clears throat> May 17th, name withheld by police, Oregon, Xavier A. Kilby, Caleb Grisanti, Gary Moncrief, 
May 18th, name withheld by police, Missouri. Timothy James Hogland. Tyrone Young Jeff Penny. Xander Mann. Brendan Bree S. Charlotte. Darian Marquis Lafayette. Raul Rosas Carsoza. Randy Cole. Robert Nazmi Roman Jr. Javad Aubrey Ahangari. Rudolfo Villanueva. Jesse Bonsignor. Patrick Watkins. Brandon Scott Odell. James Ray Jarrow. Rafael Perez. Tristan Enzinger. May 21st, name withheld by police in Louisiana. Courtney LaShawn Warren. Name withheld by police, Texas. Adam Courtney Hartley. Johnny Owen King. Juan Joseph Daniel Castellano. Cody C. Waters. May 22nd, name withheld by police in Arkansas. Steve Newsom. Dion Johnson. Edward James Shutter. John Boosie. Karen Heath McClure. Lee Howard Powell. Moises Alexander Ruiz. Roderick Devon Merchant, Jr. Rufus James Ramsey, the third. Tatiana Munguia. Timothy Jordan Schneider. Glenn Ray Cockrum. Haven A. Bailey. Manuel Beltran Moreno. Charles Mills, Jr. Luther David Medina. Francis de la Cruz Abad, Darren Dewan Chandler, Jeffrey E. Christopher, Robert Lee Evans, Efren Gomez, Angel Hernandez Grotto, Benjamin James Bennett, Devin Walker, James Sears III, Samuel Cassidy, Shy Lorraine Chantel Boyd, Anthony Leggins, Arnold Fraser Hager Jr., Herman King Myers Jr., May 28th, name withheld by police, Florida, May 29th, name withheld by police, California, David O'Donnell Reagan, Jerry Delmar Sweeper, May 30th, name withheld by police, in Illinois. May 30th, name withheld by police in Virginia. Roberto Zelinsky, Ryan Bernal, Shannon Wright, Bilal Winston Shabazz, Christopher Castro, Demetrius Stanley, Joshua Lee Moore, Michael Jackson, May 31st, name withheld by police, Texas. May 31st, name withheld by police in Iowa. Roger Dale Keller, David Peterson, Tu Yia Lore. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. 3205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org Psst You can cash app Dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send Doe to us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at 
at Swainiac1969, or Twitter at, at Swain Rocks.